Paintball Nerd. Today's guest on Paintball Nerd started playing paintball in 1984. He went pro in 1992 with Detroit Fusion. He's also played with Revolution, Image, Avalanche, Miami Effect, Infamous. He's the founder of Pro DNA and Infamous Paintball. He's a father of four, a husband, paintball legend. Welcome to the show, Mr. Travis Lemansky. <laughs> How's it going, Isaac? Good, man. Good to have you. Thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. So, yeah. So, Travis, you, you I mean, you've been in competitive paintball, right? Since pretty much the very beginning. What would you consider to be the glory days of paintball? Well, I mean, anyone that really knows me knows that I like seriously love the whole 10 man game. Um, I like mech. I think that, uh, you know, there's still like a certain skill set um, when having to like pull the trigger um, and not, you know, ramping. And, and I really do like the added like extra 10 bodies on the field. I think that that, that chess match and that, uh, you know, it, it allows for some like different, you know, fun game plans and stuff like that. So, yeah, I would say that, that the 10 man days were the glory days to me. So that was like early 2000s, late 90s, right? Correct. Yep. So why, like, why do you think those are the glory days? Um, well, you know, just to me, I can still remember like every single move of every single big game we were in. Um, and we still argue about it. Like some, some of my buddies <laughs> that are, you know, in their forties and fifties are still like, you know, arguing about these, like, dude, you should have looked left. You said you were going to look left and this and that, and like <laughs> still holding people accountable. But I think that, uh, so many things had to align for like one simple little move that everyone was like so hyper focused on just accomplishing mm. just these one little goals. And then it was like these big payoffs. And, and honestly, some of the crowds we had back then on the sidelines yeah. were, were, were bigger and better. And people were standing on top of, uh, you know, tractor trailers, like trying to get better views. And, and mm. I mean, it was like 10 deep on the sidelines everywhere. It was, it was epic. I mean, we still have 10 man today, obviously. So mm -hmm. What do you think has changed either in the game or the industry since the, the, the glory days? Well, um, obviously there was a big uh, push, you know, when they kind of shut down 10 man and all the leagues switched to X ball. There was, that was, that was sort of an industry push, I believe to sell kind of more paint and it was driven by the paint manufacturers and other manufacturers got to sell new equipment you know, different, it was an arms race sort of thing, like mm. ramping guns. And, you know, people went from shooting 40 cases in an event to shooting 40 cases in a match. You know what I mean? It was, yeah. it, it was insane. Um, so that was the big push. And, and obviously like we haven't, we were still feeling the ripples of that, like that the whole mm. industry was behind that for so many years. And there was like this big TV push and all this other stuff. So yeah, that's, uh, that's that's what left the 10 man in the dust um obviously there's you're, you're a part of this too but there's like a whole renaissance with the old 10 man mac and there's a lot of the same old dudes and then, you know for me it's just a giant stress reliever and I, I like getting out and seeing some of the old guys and and uh, you know and there's a lot of young guys playing it too but it's uh it's it's a lost art form it's pretty fun if 10 man that format became the premier format that became the highest level of competition in paintball do you think that would positively affect paintball or negatively if it became the main thing like the NXL is for sure, positively, here's my reasons. Um, there's still dudes that are, uh, you know, my age or, or older or, you know, not as in shape or whatever, and they're still contributing and it's, you know, mm. it's a little more mental. And I think, uh, when we went to straight five man X ball where guys are, you know, can barely make a corner or can't even make a corner and they're super athletes, uh, you sort of alienate a lot of the wallets in the game yeah. and you take the money out, dude. And you know, the sport starts to go in the wrong direction in my opinion. So is there, I mean, can we fix this? Can we reconcile? Can we get back to the glory um, days? Does NXL need I, to go away? No, I, I don't think, I think there's, I think there's a place for, you know, all kinds of different types of paintball. Um, but I mean, I'll always, continue to try to push and help 10 man along and, and, and do whatever I could. I mean, I threw, I threw an event this year that I brutally got killed and had tornadoes and <laughs> had, you know, event. yeah. Yeah. I lost my ass, but it was awesome. Yeah, we had fun. <laughs> you know, I, I think about this subject a lot and 
And when I think about 10 man paintball, I think about that is the format that is most closely related to what got you hooked on paintball in the first place. Going out there, being sneaky, being methodical, uh, pretty much any player being able to break open a game if they're smart enough. And I think that's what really gets people excited about the game. And X-Ball is an extremely exciting format. However, your mistakes tend to, uh, your mistakes and your triumphs tend to get washed away by the next point. You know, if someone does a great move one point and their team loses the match, no one really remembers that, right? Right, right. And I think those big moves that you saw in Tan Man back in the day, these game-breaking moves that just changed the course of that of that particular game were the things that made people famous. They created the heroes that we have today. One move. And we let's look at Rocky, right? right. Rocky <laughs> Dover the snake and push, and that, that made the man. Poor Davey. Granted. Yeah, granted, Rocky's an amazing guy, and, and, and part of his allure is, is the fact that he's amazing. But that move really did it for him, right? Right, right. No, that was that was such a huge move. And, you know, in push, you had all those slow-mo clips, and you had some, yeah. some you know, him jumping up and down, and then that 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 heroic move. And that, and that was epic. I was there in person. I'm watching this thing, and I was just like, dude, that was so sick. <laughs> <laughs> like, can he do that? Is that even legal? What is that? Yeah, that was great. Yeah. Well, Travis, tell us about your favorite memory in paintball. Oh man. I mean, there's so many. Uh, I, I literally like have been playing paintball so much longer than, you know, I haven't been playing paintball that I can't really think of anything that doesn't yeah. involve it. You know, I like, I can't ever almost every weekend, you know what I mean? I, I was playing and sometimes during the week um, and that went on for 30 years. So um, now, obviously, things have slowed down a little bit. I have many kids, and so I'm like, you know, playing dad a lot. But uh, um, you know, God, I think I think that some of the most epic memories I have were, you know, going over and playing in Europe with Avalanche, and they had that whole seven man Millennium series, um, and it was just such a an, an insane time. Cause kind of had that like paintball was sort of like skate culture at that time, and it was like, yeah meeting Europe and Europe was kind of a growing paintball market and they weren't, you know, they weren't really up to speed yet on, on tournament paintball. So it was just insane. Like al- almost all the finals ended up being like Americans, whether it was, you know, all A's and avalanche and image and this and that, but it was, it was, it was really fun. Good times. And avalanche was, you know, the rock stars of paintball during that era. In, you know, in the States. So for you guys to go over to Europe, I imagine that you were just treated like celebrities. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, we're, I'm, I really was never like a show butter type person, but like, you know, like literally La Soya was like a, a, an idol over there to some of these people. And, uh, <laughs> but it was cool. Like I have a lot of like, like memories where I would swap jerseys with some of the European dudes and I met a lot of people that I'm still friends with today that, they, you know, like um, they just, they did treat you with a different level of respect. And, and honestly, back then mm. we played in these like pretty insane stadiums that, you know, they don't yeah. do anymore, but it was, that was cool. So what's, what's the best place that paintballs brought you? Oh, um, I think the coolest tournament I ever played, uh, was, um, Magid put on this event in Sweden in Stockholm and they had a, uh, we stayed in the actual dorms of this like Olympic center. And that's wow. kind of, I guess, where they had hosted some Olympic whatever training facility. And you would just roll your gear bag out of the dorms every morning and go play your games. It was unreal, like beautiful location, um, beautiful like weather, the whole deal. And then, uh, but I think venue wise, the, the most epic venue still to this date is Huntington Beach. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's just the best backdrop for paintball ever. I wonder how we get back into stadiums in Europe. How does that happen? Um, you know, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I just started recently getting into the promoting thing. That's, that's my wife's job. I don't really do the, the yeah. paintball event stuff until just this year. But, uh, you know, I think, I think part of it too, is we've grown. We now need so many different fields that you can't fit, you know, six fields inside of one stadium now. True. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, Travis, o- over the years, I mean, you've you've watched and you've played with some of the 
the greatest players in the world. Who has been over the years your favorite teammate? Um, I think I think I I still have like the closest bond with guys like LB and Posey. Um, you know, little Andy. I mean, these are guys that I like grew up playing with and played with for you know half of my starting out career. Um, I still like super enjoy like my buddies from Avalanche and you know Rocky and Lasoya and these guys, and we still like constantly every time we're around each other we're, we're laughing about something but um but you know and then even on infamous i've had just teammates like kevin kelly rudolph i mean he's been on the team now for like 12 years so it's like uh you know these these are some of my like closest friends and uh yeah you know it's hard to like you know name them all but you know that's sure them. well outside of that who's someone that really excites you to watch on the field like someone if you know that, that if you're watching them play, you're going to stop and pay attention. Um, like today's format or like back in the day format? It could be uh, across time, across, yeah, uh, across so the JR, time span of paintball. JR, John yeah. Richardson, if, if people don't remember who he is, he was always like super, super creative, super sneaky, not a big like uh, personality on the field. Like he, he wasn't, you know, he didn't have the ponytail or crazy rocky hair, but he was, <laughs> he was like undercover, like so good. So he was always like really – uh, fun to watch because he would pull these really creative moves. Uh, is, are there any of his moves that stand out to you that you can recall? Um, I mean, it, it's literally like almost every time we were on the field, he would always be creeping, creeping. You you could see him, you know, you'd, you'd, I would always be kind of like when I started on, on, on avalanche, I was coming from image. I was still kind of like a front mid dude. Like I would, I was playing like in the mid front of the field. And then when I got mm -hmm. to avalanche, I was like, Oh my God, these are all front guys. <laughs> I was like, someone needs to be in the back. So I got to like play in the back there. And you'd really see Jr. You'd see him working. You see him start to create. You'd see his head come up over the top a lot. And then he'd go over here, and he's like looking and looking. And all of a sudden, he he'd realize like, you know, paintballs are coming out of that side of the bunker over there, and this guy's not looking at me over here. And he'd put like two or three guys away and and, and go for it. And it was always like a sweet little run through. Yeah, or you'd see him like take a kneel where there's not a bunker. Like he's in between bunkers and. It's like, how does he know he can live right there? And then he'll yeah. take off. Yep. Yeah. We got to get him back out into to playing some 10 man events. For sure. For sure. I have a great story about, we, I got him out to an ICC a few years ago and he hadn't been in the league for a little bit. And, uh, and I think we went out and had some beers and it was such, a, it was a great bonding experience because, you know, Tim had this like little players party that we were all like went to and, yeah, you know, we, we drank probably a few too many beers, but then we went and played like all day the next day. And you know how it is. Like you're there for like 6 a.m. until 6 p.m. kind of kind of yeah. playing. And uh, he was so cramped up. We couldn't even walk down the when we got back to the hotel. He couldn't <laughs> even get to the room. He was just laying in the hallway. And uh, yeah, he was dying of cramps and in pain. But I, I just took a lot of videos. Thought it was funny. Dude, I actually I got the pleasure of playing with JR at ICC two years ago with... Uh uh mirage oh yeah right on and that was that was a special time i got to play with a lot of your teammates lb and and posey and lane that was a great time yeah good dudes so travis what's your most uh maybe not your most but do you have any cherished items that you can share um god you know i was thinking about this the other day and i had something um I do have this one special cocker that was stolen from me out of my garage in California, but ah. I'm never getting that back. I've, I've realized. What was it? Uh, um, it was just this like little center feed mini cocker that had like a green, like front block and a, you know, sparkly Detroit sticker on the side. And I don't know, it just, it really was, didn't, it wasn't a twister. It wasn't anything like fancy or anything. It just was the one I had won so many events with and it was kind of the, you know, just, felt right that gun but you know it's, I'm, I'm sure it's in some uh scrapyard somewhere like the person that stole it was probably like this thing sucks <laughs> were you were you living in pb when this happened no i was actually living in sorry uh, i didn't understand oops, that serious serious <laughs> um, yeah no we i was living in uh in ladera ranch which is like south orange county and there was just i think there was like a a bunch of work being done in the neighborhood and I left the garage door open. So I think it was just someone walking by. saw it. Jeez. Yeah. Snipe me. What about, uh, do you, do you have anything with you right now? Anything cool you can show us? 
I mean, I have like a little trophy room back here, hey. but <laughs> are you in your office right now? Yeah, I'm in the office. I'm actually in the conference room. Oh, cool. Yeah. So we have, uh, I can turn my little thing around. But, yep. Our little monitors and computers and stuff like that in here. So are those Ferrero shares on the table that I saw? There is. I had a I had a vendor wow. uh, come to visit me and brought these gifts, and I'm like, "Listen, dude, I'm trying to lose some weight here." Yeah, don't put those in your office. Those are those I know, are, I know. Those are kids tonight. <laughs> yeah, of the year. Uh, what are you What are you working on at Infamous? That's new and exciting. Anything you can tell us? Yeah, I mean, ob obviously, we're like constantly working on new products, um, but uh, you know, like I think everyone knows, we kind of we have a you know, a new CS3 we're working on milled version. We have a new, um, new line of soft goods coming at, at cup. We have, um, some little small, uh, projects in our like trigger and barrel stuff that we're doing. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we have a, a bunch of new products. We, we do have some stuff we're, we're going to probably drop here, um, in Chicago just to kind of beat the, uh, the world cup rush. And then we came out with some cool new like ghosted tanks. I don't know if you saw those, but we did. Some, I did like, see those. Yeah. Tone on tone, black on black. Like everyone kind of dances into that. Yeah. So anyways, we dropped that stuff yesterday. So it's, you know, it is. When does the CS3 come out? I, I've been waiting for pictures on that. Did well, we don't one? have an exact date yet. We just get asked daily. So we decided uh, to like let people know, but it's um, it, basically it's going to be after Chicago, but sometime before cup. That's the, that's the rumor. Nice. All right. The uh, the barrels that you guys have that that are engineered to like the, the slits are small enough to where water like the surface area of water can't go into the barrel. How did right. you come up with that? So uh, we have a one of our engineers on staff here, um, Craig, he's been like thinking about this and thinking about this. And he's like, what do you think? And I was like, I don't know, man, let's, let's, let's make some, you know, and I've been around and there's always like barrels are always like so gimmicky and there's always someone's trying to do something different and new and it's hard, right? Like you can mill them up, but it's not, really, it's just milling. Um, well, he, uh, he ended up calculating like the, you know, like standard porting and then, you know, you put it into the, the CAD file where you can like actually calculate this, this amount of porting is, is actually this amount of volume. And, we went through quite a few revisions um, to find one that actually like worked really well. Um, and then we just, you know, tested the hell out of it. And I think the very first um, event we had was I think in Texas, which if you played in Texas, it's rained and, uh, yeah. and this thing poured on us and, and everybody was like, just, you know, they didn't have to tape their barrels. The guns aren't like super loud and clacky. And I mean, they shoot great in just regular, you know, dry air, but then if, if there is bad weather, which it seems like paintball likes to attract. Um, yes, it does. You know, they passed the, the first test flying colors. We went into production and the rest is history. Well, I thought it was a great innovation and I thought it was under celebrated uh, because I, I remember taping up my barrel and I remember my gun sounding like shit and, and, uh, yeah. and just not smoke, shooting as good. Like smoke that. You yeah. Can't see. yeah, exactly. So I think, uh, I think that particular innovation deserves a little bit more boosting and more people need to be made aware of it because it solves a very real problem in, in competitive paintball. And that's that when it starts raining, your paint doesn't fly straight, you know? Right. Right. No, it, it really does work good. And, and we, we always have like a, a big rush, you know, like at the booth when, when it starts to rain, people come over and they're like looking for yep. like raincoats and visors and they're like, give me some Silencio barrels. So do yeah, you have a barrel cool. made of titanium? We did. Um, we only did it for like one kind of small run of only like a few hundred. I can't remember how many we made, but um, it just ended up being so hard to like, yeah, um, you know, hone the inside and get it like the right finish and this and that, that we just kind of stopped doing it. And, and to be honest, like more people bought the aluminum ones and, you know, you have those guys that, that like the titanium and they were obviously like the sparks. Yeah, they're four times more expensive, but they don't. At, yeah. at the end of the day, you don't. We didn't sell as many as as we thought we would, and mm. once we sold out, we sold out. They're just they're really hard to make. Travis, how did Infamous become? How, like, how did it go from a team name to it becoming this this huge brand? Like, how did that how did that transition happen? Um, well, kind of out of force. <laughs> so I uh, 
I've worked in the industry for a lot of years. Um, when I graduated college um, in Michigan, I ended up, you know, working in for Crossman in upstate New York. They were like a BB gun company trying to get into paintball. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I started my professional career working there. And then I got a job in San Diego at JT USA, which was like back uh, when JT was in San Diego and they were yeah. like a motocross company just getting into paintball or they had, they had been in a few years, obviously, but they were like really exploding. Um, and I worked there for a number of years and then I ended up uh, going to work for national and starting a brand empire and doing all this other stuff. And then um, long story short, uh, as the industry declined and, and got gobbled up and got bought out and this and that um, I had to sort of wait, outweigh my like non-competes. So in the meantime, I was doing um, foundation FNDN. That's my like, like heated apparel, technical apparel company. So I was doing mm -hmm. that. But then when my non-competes ran out, um, I didn't want to give up on Infamous. I felt like I still loved paintball and I still loved like my team. And I didn't want them to like uh, just go away. So I started making paintball stuff just to support the team. Um, and that's really when it became a brand was because I was having to sell stuff to like pay for hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of travel and entrance fees and paint and yeah. this and that, you know, it's super expensive to, to run a pro team. So, so you, did, did I catch that right? You created empire. Yeah. Yeah. So Gino had like trademarked this name empire and he had a logo and had some stuff, but he was like, uh, you know, you're working at JT, obviously like you guys can't miss down there. Like we're making any, they literally like JT could put, their name on anything and it would sell back yeah. then um right and the, and the products were good it was he just uh when he hired me he was like yo you i need to do what jt is doing like he 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 was basically a, a distributor at the time so he would be mm -hmm. buying other people's products and selling them so he yeah. you know for example buy a push goggle and sell push but it, they weren't around but he wanted his own brand to make you know margins from you know like a manufacturer's margins and right. uh so that was that was empire so he kind of put me in charge of that and i ran with that through the key years and then uh you know so i, I really did have like a pretty good um idea of how to how to make things and and, and run a brand at this point but when you did that you had to mm -hmm. sign an agreement saying i'm not going to make any other brands that compete with empire um, I didn't, I didn't have a non-compete with empire. I did later in my career, like the, the whole empire thing, they got bought out again by Richmond who bought them like seven times. But, uh, <laughs> when, when key sold the GI or, or was purchased, um, they moved all of sales and marketing down to Fort Lauderdale. And at first it was kind of like, you know, we'd like everyone down there. And then it was like, you have to be down there. So I was sort of like, I, have four kids. I can't go down there. We're in Michigan now. And uh, yeah, so I had to make some pretty tough choices to not go um, at a brief stint at Valken, which, which is where I did have a non-compete that I, you know, had to mm -hmm. wait until that one ran out. Gotcha. Yeah. Travis, what would you say it takes to get to the level that you're at in paintball, not just competitively, but in the industry you're, you've, 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 I mean, you've become a giant in the industry. So for those of us that have aspirations to get to that point, I mean, what kind of advice would you give? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know what, what, which way you mean. Are you talking about like with the business or you mean with the team or as a player? Both, yeah. So, so as a player, you know, what, you know, what advice would you give to someone that wants to reach the top of competitive paintball and also create a living in the industry? Yeah. So that happened to me out of necessity. Like now, you know, you have guys, mouse and J Rab, whoever, like that are literally making livable salaries that are like, it's good money. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was pro, like even the best players, uh, were getting like, you know, Hey, here's some guns, dude, but have fun hustling them. You know what I mean? It was yeah. like, it was, you got equipment, you got this and that, maybe you got a little bit of money, but it wasn't, you had to work in the industry. And, and honestly, like I loved paintball. So I was like, if I'm going to, if I'm going to continue to play and not go get like a real job, let's, uh, you know, let's work in the industry. So that's why, that's what made me like pursue like a career in the sport. But how did you build it, Travis? Like how, <laughs> how did you, cause this is not an easy task, right? Like paintball nerd right. is a small thing that I'm trying to build and it's tremendously hard, right. To, to gain a following, to, 
to get people interested. And, you know, what you've created with Infamous is no small feat. And I'm not asking for the secret sauce. I'm not, you know, no, there is like, no secret sauce. I mean, it's, it's, there's no secret sauce. I've told people that I mentor and talk to on a regular basis. Uh, you literally just have to be consistent and show up every day. Hmm. Um, obviously, you know, there's some luck and there's some talent and there's some things that all meet in the middle, but uh, working hard and showing up every day is how you make it. You know, the people that quit and turn around or go somewhere else because it's not worth it, they never make it. So that's that's the secret sauce. Worth it. So right, or or you know, some people just get a job and they're like, "Hey, dude, there's easy money over here," but like, uh, you know, there's no such thing. So, well, if you if you put the same amount of energy that you've put towards your career in paintball, if you put that towards being a lawyer or a dentist, or if you put it towards being a musician, do you think that it would be more lucrative? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I think. <laughs> So you have to love paintball, right? In order for you to get, get to your point, right? Get to your level in the, in the game and in the industry, you have to absolutely love the sport because the amount of effort that it takes, you could put that same effort towards something else, right? Right. Yeah. You, yeah. You have to be into it. And when you're convinced, I knew like right away, I was like, this is the best game ever. I was like, this is sweet. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I know like first person shooter video games, like a lot of people are into that. And then you play paintball and you're like, dude, there's actually really projectiles flying by me and hitting me and stuff like that. Like this is way cooler. So people the, are the yelling, rush is, running yeah. around. Yeah. yeah. The rush is insane. So I was always like, this is it. This is like, this is, this is it for me. So I, I kind of knew right then that, that this is what I wanted to do. There you go. Are you reading anything that you would recommend I read or the, the viewers um, read? Yeah, I like a lot of Malcolm Gladwell stuff. I think a lot of his books give some real insight into life. And uh, like Blink is a good decision making book. You know, you're always going to make a million decisions in your life. Um, uh, Tipping Point is another one of his good ones. So, I think I think start there, and then you'll 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 go on to if you haven't already read those. Cool, Travis. How do you want to be? How do you want to be remembered in paintball? Oh, it's a good one. Um, I don't know. I guess I've never really thought about it. I, I just have never really been the guy that's looking for recognition. I just want to stay in my lane and, and plug away until we're at the top, you know? So I don't know. I don't, I don't really, you. I don't care if I'm remembered, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, you are right. That, that's, that's a, that's a reality of where you're at is that you're certainly going to be remembered. And, you know, I think about it a lot. You know, I want to be remembered. But, you know, it's it's I think people's actions reflect how they actually want to be remembered in this game. And I would say that, yeah, I, you, you know, you would be remembered as a pioneer of of the game. You'd be remembered as someone that that uh, that changed the game, that changed the industry and contributed a lot to it. Uh, I think you've done a lot of wonderful things for the sport. What are you what are you most thankful for that paintball has given you? Um, well, you know, I've got a wife and I've got four kids that, uh, I got through paintball basically. Um, I've got, an, <laughs> yeah. I've got an amazing, uh, group of friends and friendships that, uh, I've made, you know, not just on all the teams I played on, but just industry people and in, in business and, and everything else. Like I've, you know, become very close with, you know, almost, almost all my best friends are like obviously in paintball. You yeah. know, we still have relationships like with my high school buddies and things like that. But, uh, you know, it's just, you know, my life is this sport at this point. So I guess. Awesome. That. Well, Travis, man, thank you so much for your time here today. Is there anything that you want to part with for the paintball community? Uh, no, I guess I am uh, just happy to still be in it and still be a part of it and still be making cool products that uh, people enjoy. And we're still competing and, you know, the whole deal. Go to infamouspaintball.com and check out their products. Check out check out their Silencio barrels that repel water out of the porting. Check those out. Yeah, see, I, I can't even do the shameless plugs. I just feel bad. <laughs> Is there anything else that you'd like me to plug? Uh, no, man. I'm, I'm good. We're good. Yeah, check out Infamous Paintball. Check out uh, Skeleton Squad. That's our new membership thing. Um, What's know. Skeleton Squad? What is that? Oh, so we have a new, like, membership program. Um, so obviously, like, you know, 
like the whole pro DNA thing, that's because like me and my company were made of like the pro, like old pros in the sports and our DNA yeah. kind of thing. So we're, yeah. we know how to make all the stuff. We've been making this stuff. So now we have this group um, and it's, it's a membership club that gets like, not just like inside access to the team and all that good stuff. You have all that, but it has like, you know, we make custom curated products that, that, you know, we only get to these dudes and it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, like we try to over deliver on everything and, and, uh, and yeah, so it's just getting how do you, started. How does one join the skeleton squad? Well, you just go to skeleton squad.com and uh, sign up and you're in. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, Travis, thanks again, buddy. I appreciate you. All right. Thanks. I appreciate it.